Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Matt and let us talk about the strategy, specifically tire and pit strategy for the Imola 2022 Grand Prix for Formula One. Uh, the strategy was that there was no strategy. In all seriousness, uh, the strategy was that, you know, all the teams were kind of trying to figure out kind of how it went. It was definitely a, a race that there was no way to really predict strategy. So everything was very reactive due to the changing of the uh, track temperature, uh, changing of mainly the weather and how the track was drying. So let's kind of take a step back and uh, kind of add some context here. So it was on Thursday or Friday that it was starting to be announced over social media that Imola was, or rather all of Italy was going to have rainstorms pretty much throughout the entire weekend. But if in the random stroke of luck that the race happened to happen under dry conditions, Pirelli still put out their estimated tire guide, which uh, again, I always love uh, reading up here about what they think with their strategists in the house, um, you know, of course, determining the tire compound with the FIA and then figuring out, okay, which would be most likely the best strategy here. So you want to see the tire strategies uh, for the most part was pretty similar to Bahrain, if I'm remembering th that correctly. Uh, what was is going to be the main strategy was you start out on mediums and about anywhere between lap 22 to 29 you change out the hards and that's it um, even though the hards are about you know second second and a half slower a second uh, even though higher tires are technically a second to a second and a half slower a lap than the mediums uh, over the course of the race it was 65 laps or thereabout so we're going from lap 30 to 65 so it's about 35 seconds so honestly you could technically get another pit stop in that window for another uh, set of tires if you're doing like medium to softs per se which i think is more or rather uh, softs and medium, which is kind of uh, displayed in strategy three here. Um, but uh, with the time taken going through the pit lane, getting your tires, uh, you know, changed out and then exiting the pit lane, taking a couple laps to get your tires up to temperature, um, it just looked like that the strategy was going to be a, a pretty much a one stopper because you didn't have to worry about, you know, you only had to worry about doing that once uh, versus doing it multiple times. So on the flip side here, instead of starting on mediums, it could have been starting on softs here and changing uh, them out on lap 13 to 18 thereabouts and then again uh, going back to hearts uh, kind of like strategy one so you're changing to hearts sooner but uh, hearts this season has looked like that they la lasting about 40 laps or thereabouts so this we had seen it with Albon. They can last longer. So I think that's where uh, these guys, you know, Pirelli was kind of thinking that it could last a little bit longer. Again, you're getting close to about here where you would have some significant degradation and you'd probably be, you know, losing a second a lap um, to that degradation where it's instead of being, you know, in this case, instead of being a second lap slower on hearts and mediums, it'd be two seconds lap slower on softs, then you'd have your degradation. So honestly, could be as hard, as bad as about three seconds lap slower if I'm doing my math uh, correctly here. Um, but yeah, it's just, you can do it. It is possible. Uh, but you lose a significant amount of time by doing it. Apparently, Pirelli was thinking that would be a very close uh, second to the uh, one-stopper, because I imagine that they'd experience similar degradation, and uh, apparently to them, they've got all the numbers. I definitely don't. Um, but their, their strategists were thinking that the degradation experienced around this area to the end uh, was at a similar pace and probably flattens out. Uh, so it's, it's not as bad as I'm making it out to be. And then finally, uh, strategy three, uh, if I had any opinion or any preference, if I was a driver or a strategist, I probably would have gone for this one here because um, yes, you would probably, again, 
uh, lap 12 to 17, depending on about a lap earlier than the one stopper strategy. Uh, you'd change the mediums, but you'd be about you know a second, second and a half quicker a lap than the hards to about here. And then you would experience a great big deal of degradation. Uh, maybe not as bad as the second a lap, but could be as bad as. Um, and then around here, you'd lose a solid 40 to 50 seconds in the pits. And then you'd have, you know, two seconds faster lap up to about here. And then about the same time, you'd experience some degradation, but you would probably be okay for the rest of the race. Um, so yeah, I, it's just, even though I would have technically liked to do this strategy, I've in F1 2021 and whatnot, I've never really liked the hard tires. They're way too slippery for me. I can't keep any grip in them. Um, so I normally like to go for like medium strategies just for keeping the tire temperature up and uh, you know, having those higher levels of grip, you know, having that softer compounds again. Uh, what was being allegedly going to be used, uh, C2, C3, and C4, uh, hard to soft in that order. Um, but yeah, apparently it's the one stopper was definitely the way to go until the rain hit. So fortunately in this case, uh, or unfortunately, depending on those who enjoy their uh, wet races versus those who don't, um, what was going to be kind of interesting is that the rain happened kind of overnight into the morning and stopped a little bit before the race. I mean, the track was still completely soaked. Uh, there were no dry lines, no nothing. There were no practice runs. There were no nothing. So it was just a wet track. I mean, fortunately, not many puddles. It was just soaked, but that was it. Um, so as the teams were starting to take a look at the track, they're like, well, it's still wet. I mean, they could have done a gamble and said that you could probably do mediums or something for the first couple of laps while everybody else is drying up. But I think that's going for an ex extremely risky strategy, assuming that the track is going to dry out very quickly. And I think everybody did the right move here about choosing the intermediate tires. So because everybody was on intermediates, this made for a very interesting race because it was exclusively and only down to pace and pace alone versus having to deal with all these weird strategies and whatnot. It was just who was the fastest period. So I think most of everybody did a pretty similar strategy, obviously. You know, everybody's starting out on intermediates and then changing to mediums around 17 through 19. Uh, Ricardo had an issue at the beginning, again, we'll talk about it in a bit, um, where he had to pit early to another set of intermediates, and then he actually started going for an undercut strategy. So something where uh, pitting earlier than your opponents and seeing if, you know, when everybody else pits, you know, having that additional time that you can make up, having that gap of not trying to deal with racing everybody else, you just set your lap times, and hopefully by everybody racing each other and getting all bunched up and not being able to pass and losing times, again, racing, that when they finally get to the pits, uh, you come out ahead of them as they finally come back out. And in all honesty, it was it was quite... Uh, I was hoping for that because, you know, Ricardo, in last place now, had clearly nothing to lose. You know, let's take a little bit of a gamble here. Changes the medium before everybody else, but... For an undercut strategy to really work, you need to be a couple laps out. But the fact that somebody saw Ricardo pit, everybody said, well, McLaren's pitting. They seem to know what they're doing. Let's all pit. And that's when everybody came in for the pits. The thing that I found interesting here is Pirelli was assuming that everybody would have been able to do a one-stopper originally. So again, the medium to hard. So if I was in Ricardo's shoes, I probably would have gone to hard sooner. But due to the fact that, you know, everybody else shortly thereafter went to mediums, I think mediums was the correct play here. Um, but the thing that I found very interesting is that everybody, normally mediums, about 18 laps, so about here, would really start falling off. So I, apparently when it comes to wet conditions, having a track that is actually colder even though the grip is maybe not there as much, 
Uh, having a colder track really extends the lifespan of your tires, and it's insane to see that they go as far as, you know, 45 laps. I want to say last year, oh, I can't even remember what race it was, uh, but there's a race that uh, Akon had actually done a whole 72 to 74 laps on intermediates, period. So um, if you can keep your pace right, if you're not doing it too aggressively and the track is just perfect enough cold conditions but not cold enough where you have zero grip there's that fine line where you can get apparently insane uh lifespan out of of course pace is hugely gonna suck because of it but you can keep your tires going forever but uh uh the other part of the strategy here that was very unexpected um red bull really likes to put on softs pretty pretty quickly if they can uh, so, as far as I could tell here, that was actually pretty interesting to see Ferrari come out, put on softs first, and then uh, Red Bull, very reactionary, comes in, does their softs. Because apparently both uh, Leclerc and uh, Red Bull had seen that the track was drying at a, fi a fast enough rate. It said, hey, you know, I think softs can knock off quite a bit of lap time, and Verstappen just disappeared. Um, 16 seconds in, into the into the future there in front of Perez so it's just like he was he was on a different level today which as a Mercedes and McLaren fanboy it pains me to say but at the same time too it just seeing Verstappen pull away like that it's just like that guy is just untouchable today so kudos to Max that was a very consistent very quick performance which I can't argue with that. <laughs> it's just pace was there today. So then we go to our famous graph provided by racefans.net. Um, again, like I was saying, there really wasn't much of a pit or tire strategy. It's kind of difficult to say in these conditions. Again, you can very clearly tell um, that you start out on you know your single compound and 17 through 19 people go into the pits basically everybody uh and then from there you can pretty easily tell from there who made uh pit stops and who didn't like for example you know uh 30 to 32 somewhere there yeah apparently it says you know 30 31 um daniel goes in for the hearts actually has a little bit of a, a battle here with mick but yeah that was a very obvious pit stop there so again kind of like i was describing a little bit earlier this race was interesting because it was a race of pace alone um you can tell when mistakes are made you can tell when um who just had the faster car who had the right setup who didn't have the right setup and i've got Fortunately, a lot of notes describing all of that here today. So, biggest failures, losers, uh, disappointments of uh, Imla 2022. Gotta start out with this tiny little red dot. Carlos Sainz Jr. once again. Uh, in my uh, 2022 Formula 1 predictions, I said that, you know, Carlos would be uh, cool, as calm as a cucumber and um, would have very few mistakes and Leclerc would still have those mistakes. He would have great pace, but having enough mistakes that he would have multiple DNFs. He would win races, but Sainz would be consistently on the podium. Um, I got that completely screwed up. Um, something's going on with Sainz mentally where he's got these big mistakes he gets himself in these poor positions and, or poor situations and he just can't pull himself out of it. Um, situation here is that Daniel hit the curb on the inside of turn one, um, blacked up, went wide into signs, spun signs out, went straight in the gravel trap and he was out again. And it pains me because Sainz is such a good driver. He really is. You don't get into Formula One by not being a good driver. So seeing him having these constant failures when he's when he knows he's in a race winning car is just it's really sad to see again going off that kind of uh, tangent there biggest losers i mean it's pretty obvious here uh, next failure here was daniel ricardo started in sixth for god's sakes and finished in 18th i mean 
That should have been an easy double points for McLaren today. Or rather on Sunday, whenever you guys see this. Um, that should have been an easy one. And Daniel has been making, kind of like Carl is, he's been making these really weird mistakes. Or it's just, it's not even that he knows that he's in a good car. Because honestly, it's it's. I still don't believe McLaren's got a good car. But yet, the past two races have shown otherwise. I feel like that they just got their setup right. I'm just expecting them to be back down in this range. Apparently not. Apparently, they flipped the switch and figured it out. So with that switch being flipped, it's beyond me that Daniel isn't mentally there, that he's making these really odd mistakes, that he's crashing people out, that he's crashing himself out, and it's just... Daniel's a very obvious number two driver, which is weird to say, but in this case, if he lasts in Formula One past 2023 at this rate if he has a similarly bad season next year as it is right now sorry to see him go but talent there get him in next biggest loser i'll try to be quick on this i've already spent way too much talking about this uh schumacher it sounded like that he qualified well yeah qualified 10th in a haas doing great doing great things and literally turn one or turn two instant that cost him the race. Uh, what happened here is that uh, lap one, turn one. Actually, it was turn two. It was turn two. Um, Alonso, somebody else, and, and Mick Schumacher were going three wide into turn two, and Schumacher kind of got pushed a little bit and hit the curb and had actually oversteered with his back left tire into. Alonso, which explains that missing side pod. It was just so funny to see on lap four, uh, the F1 TV directions just like, why does Alonso just not have a side pod? <laughs> and thus it was Fernando Alonso in the mystery of the missing side pod. Um, but after looking around and reviewing, it looks like that again, Schumacher hit that inside curb on turn two, hit that, you know, side pod of, of, uh, Fernando Alonso, uh, Schumacher then spun out and just fell down the queue and wasn't able to recover there. He had a couple more mistakes and was kind of skipping the corner of uh, turn 14 and 15. Poor, poor weekend for the kid. I, I feel so bad for him, but it is what it is. Alonso, same thing. All right start. Kind of kept his nose clean. He's like, I'm letting everybody else crash and have those issues. And then he himself turned two at an instant. He was able to keep going. It didn't look like that it really affected the performance much in the car. Um, I was thinking that by having a giant hole in the side pot that would affect cooling, but apparently uh, with talks with my engineering uncle, it actually uh, affects more downforce than anything else where you have uh, the air being sucked in and while it's doing so, both sucking in and pushing the car down as it's flowing over the top, also pushing it down. So kind of interesting to see there, but uh, apparently it was terminal enough damage where they just had to put him in, uh, pull, pull him into the pits and say, that's it. So the interesting game here, I think Alpine is playing is that with the regulation freeze for the engine was announced is that they can't change the change the performance past uh, 2022. I think they're. I think it either already has happened or like an official freeze is happening in September, so they can't really make that many big changes. Um, but they can up until 2025 uh, make reliability changes. So uh, kind of like Red Bull's uh, Christian Horner and made mention. I'd rather fix a fast car versus try to make a reliable slow car fast. So again, the, I think that's the game that uh, Alpine is playing. Uh, of, unfortunately, it's at the cost of Fernando Alonso. Uh, at this rate, I really hope that uh, the car uh, reliability changes for the better in the future. Because at this rate, he's he's going to be out in 2023. He just, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm just, ah. uh, other biggest losers here. I got to say Hamilton. Uh, where do you go? Back here. I mean... Uh, Qualified 14th, absolutely horrendous qualifying. Uh, that car has got some huge porpoising issues. And unfortunately for him, um, ended in 14th. 
and the entire race within a half a second most of the time 0.2 to 0.3 seconds off the back of Gasly. Props to Gasly, you did a great race defending a seven-time world champion. Um, but yeah, it was just miserable to see a Hamilton. The weirdest thing in the world is to see Russell ending in P4, and he's in the top five. Only one of the few drivers to finish in the top five every race. I actually want to say he was the only one that has in the past four races, which is a wild statistic. When you got a brand new rookie to the team in that place and your seven time world champion is somewhere down here. It's like, are they giving Lewis like 500 kilograms of ballasts in the back of his car? Like, what's going on? It's so weird to see such a disparity between the two of them. Um, and I, I don't know if it's having something to do with, um, you know, the younger drivers just dealing with the porpoising better. Charles Leclerc said he doesn't care. Like, he doesn't notice it at all while Sainz is whining about it all the time. And I wonder if it's the same thing with uh, George and uh, Hamilton. So, I want to see Lewis do better, but right now that car is just not working well for him. It's working well. George has got it figured out. So why can't Lewis? Well, only time will tell. We'll only find out then. And last but not least, uh, biggest failure. Uh, unfortunately, was Leclerc. Um, Max just took off into the few, uh, into the distance. He just he just went, and Leclerc had some very very close fights with Perez. He was on the on the back of him, almost just outside of DRS range. Um, but yeah, then he then he. As he's trying to make up time, uh, went over the curb in turn 14. It's just that curb was a death trap for everybody. That turn was a death trap for everybody um, during the Grand Prix. Spun it out. Very lucky to not have a DNF, but I uh, was able to bring it back to the pits, get a chair change, get a front wing change. But by then, he was only able to make up a place or two. So he's still... 30 points ahead of Verstappen in the Drivers' Championship. It's just weird, though, to, to see. I think this is the first big major mistake that Leclerc has had. Um, and it's cool to see that he's had such consistent races before. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that this is one of the few mistakes in the season. I, I don't want him to have this being a turning point where he becomes like a Carlos Sainz and then Verstappen and Perez just clean up the points while uh, Leclerc is having issues. So I'm knock on wood. I'm hoping that this is a one of few mistakes, not one of many to come. Finally, after a ad nauseum ex explanation of, of the biggest losers, the biggest winners are Red Bull. Obviously, they're on the pace. They had great strategy as far as the you know, pitting when there's very few other people around here. Pit the softs right after Leclerc did that was able to keep their cars on the track. Don't know what else to say. Great one-two finish. Awesome. Next up is... I'm so happy to say this. McLaren's Lando Norris. McLaren finally figured it out. Um, after Australia, you know, during Australia, whatever was the setup, or they just found the switch that says stop turning the car, you know, putting it on fire or whatever. Um, they figured it out, and he was able to get the performance and just go for it which qualified in P5 and ended in P3. So great, 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 great. Again, kind of like I was describing earlier, uh, Russell has been having a fantastic time. Um, P4, only driver to consistently end in a top five finish for the past four races. So keep going, George. You're doing great. Uh, Bottas, P5. Almost had Russell. Would have loved to see Bottas beat out Mercedes, but uh, the best thing was to see is, is that when he got back to uh, the Alfa Romeo pit garage, uh, he was just greeted with warmth and, and cheers and applause. And it was it was great to see him uh, just just basking in the glory because he is honestly a great driver. Um, I don't know what the past couple of seasons were where he's just 
was nowhere to be found while the Mercedes had the pace. I mean, it's like kind of flip of what's going on. Um, Bottas would be somewhere down here and Lewis would be somewhere up here. And sometimes Bottas would be up here very rarely. But uh, the fact that he's consistently putting them some great results recently, love to see it. I always like to point out this driver because it is a very silent, unexpected one. Mr. Yuki Tsunoda, uh, P6. I mean, he started in 12th and on the opening lap, made up two places and gained up to another one up to P9, you know, by lap four or five as uh, Alonso had uh, pitted and ended this race. Um, Yuki's been doing great this this race. Um, I, I feel like that this his recent performances are showing that he is capable of a great drive. Again, at the very end of, of last year of Abu Dhabi, I'll bring it up again and again and again. P4, P5, I think it was P5, um, which was out of the normal for him. But ever since then, he's just like, this is my last year potentially in Formula One. Like, I gotta make, I gotta fight for my seat. And he is unfortunately wiping the floor with Gasly. I, I wanted it to see it reversed. I love to see Gasly up in here because he deserves it and more, but just, he is not, he's like Hamilton. For whatever reason, the, the number one driver in the team just can't figure out the car, but your number twos, they're, they're, they've got it. They've got it figured out. And finally, one of the last biggest winners is actually Aston Martin. Um, qualified in 15th and 13th respectively. Ended in 7th and in 10th. Uh, the only other team apart from Red Bulls to score a double points finish. So basically meaning that both drivers scored points. So uh, I'm I'm here for it. Um, Vettel had a horrible Australian Grand Prix. First race back after having COVID, missing the first two races. Um, this is something that he deserved right here. He deserves 7th place. I mean... That car, apparently also similarly, is starting to, starting to go in the right direction. No idea what happened, but uh, um, that car is just... I, I think it was just a setup change. I think the setup was just right for Imola. So we're going to see if uh, it worked out in the future. I really hope for at least Vettel's case that Aston Martin is, is on, on the up and up. So again, thank you so much for watching uh, this review of strategy. Um, more kind of a, a recap of the race, I guess, uh, and who did great and who didn't. Uh, strategy was intermediates to mediums, and maybe if you're ballsy enough to swap to softs. So that was the race. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. Everybody was very reactive due to the weather conditions. So, you know, it is what it is. It's, you can only review so much of something that was reactive instead of something that was meticulously planned. So again, thanks so much for watching this content. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. We've got a lot of new stuff coming up. Uh, actually, a Forza for Horizon 5. Forza Horizon 5. And actually a Forza Horizon 5 uh, video coming out on Friday. Kind of a weird one out of the blue, but I think you guys will like it. So stay tuned for that. Again, thanks so much for watching. Hope you guys have a great day. Take care. Bye.